All right, everybody turn to your neighbor, say hi. My name is, my major is, I'm going to graduate in this year. All right, everybody get to know each other? Yeah. All right. It's good to know each other because some of you might actually give other people jobs one day. Or you'll need to ask somebody else for a job. All right. It's good, to, it's good to know these people. Okay. Hello, class. Welcome back to another uh, lecture on physics. This is our learning glass, learning glass approach to lectures on physics. I wanted to talk to you about gravity for a second. And the Super Bowl is, of course, the best friend of the physicist, and you should just always carry a super ball with you wherever you go. It's just fun to play with. Right? But let's think about the super ball for a second. If I hold up this super ball, like so, are there forces that are acting on this super ball right now? What do you guys think? Yes. Yes. Okay. What is the net force acting on the super ball? Zero. Why zero? Because it's not moving. Okay. Who said zero? What's your name? Adam. Adam? Can you hand the mic back to Adam? Adam and I will have a little chat real quick. Okay, Adam, here's my Super Bowl. I'm holding it stationary. What's the net force acting on the Super Bowl? Zero. Zero. Why? Because the normal, there's a normal force applied to it and gravity as well. Okay, so I'm applying a force holding it up. Gravity is applying a force down. Yeah. Right? Okay. Now I'm going to let it go. After I let it go, what was the net force on the Super Bowl before it hit the table? Whatever its potential energy was. Okay. Potential energy is not uh, a force, though, right? Yeah. It's, of course, related to the force. Yeah. The so after I let it go, is the net force on the ball zero? No. No. What is it? It's the force of gravity. It's the force of gravity. That's right. So force is zero, I let it go. Force is mg down. Once it hits the table and compresses the bottom of the super ball, what's the net force on it? It's is it zero? Is it not zero? That's a tough question, right? Let's reverse it for a second. Here's the super ball. It's going to go up. What is the force on the ball at the top of its motion? What is the net force on it? Zero. Okay. Why do you say it's zero? Because for a moment in time, it's, it's, it's not moving. It's not moving. Velocity is zero. But what is Newton's second law? Newton's second law doesn't have velocity in it. Newton's second law has what? F Mass equals. times acceleration. Mass times acceleration. So does this thing have acceleration at the top of its motion? Uh, yes. Yeah, it certainly does. Remember, acceleration is delta V over delta T. In other words, is it about to change its speed? Yeah. Absolutely. It was zero, but we know in the next instant it's going to be falling again. So in fact, the Super Bowl, as soon as it leaves my hand, it has a force on it due to gravity that is down while it's on the way up, down when it's at the top of the motion, down when it's going back down. As soon as it leaves my hand, it's mg the whole time. Okay. So back to the question of when it hits the table here. When it comes to rest and it's in contact with the table, is the force on it zero, or is it not zero? Adam, what do you think? Well, at one point, the net force on it is zero, but then the ball compresses a little, and I'd say the force is greater than zero. Yeah, exactly right. The ball compresses. It's like a spring is compressed, and when a spring is compressed, there is a net force on it. And there is certainly a net force on it when it's compressed, because we know in the next instant it's going to bounce and start to come back up. So there is some delta V. All right, fun with Super Bowls. 
This is all tying into this idea that gravity exhibits a force. Okay? The gravity from the Earth pulling down on that super ball <coughs> made the super ball fall towards the Earth. But it doesn't just apply to the super ball on the Earth. It, of course, applies to you on the Earth. And it also applies to the moon in its orbit, in its orbit and the Earth in its orbit around the sun. It applies universally. And this was the huge step by Newton, which was Newton's universal law of gravitation. Okay. What he said was the following. The force of gravity <coughs> is negative g m1 m2 divided by r squared. M1 is, of course, the mass of one object. M2 is the mass of the other object. So if mass 1 was the Earth, then mass 2 would be our Super Bowl. G, well, let's do R first and then we'll worry about G. R is the distance between the two. And if you have spherical objects, then it's center of mass to center of mass distance. And then finally, G is the universal gravitational constant. And it has a particular number. We'll give you a few digits here. 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. What about this negative sign? That negative sign just means it's attractive. Okay? Masses are attracted together, which is a good thing. Because if masses weren't attracted together, guess what? As soon as the Big Bang happened and we had expansion of the universe, stuff would never come back together. Planets would never form. Stars would never form. The only reason that planets and stars form is because gravity is pulling them together. And if none of those stars formed and none of those planets formed, you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here, <coughs> none of us would be here. And so we wouldn't have to worry about this universal law of gravitation at all. Maybe that would be better. I don't know. It's not too bad. All right. Let's think about the two masses here. M1 and M2. R, we said, if they're spherical, it's center of mass to center of mass, which for a sphere, it's right in the middle of the object. G is the universal gravitational constant. This says there is a force on M1 due to M2 trying to pull it towards it. But there is also a force of exactly equal magnitude opposite direction on M2. And we know exactly what that force is. <coughs> the magnitude of that force is G M1 M2 over R squared. Any two objects in the universe are attracted together by gravity for any object in the universe. Okay, which is kind of weird to think about, right? Because you're all familiar with being stuck on the Earth, right? But you're not as familiar with being attracted to other objects. So for instance, if I'm in outer space and my space shuttle is floating over there somewhere and I can't get to it, how do I get to that space shuttle? Well, we talked about this before with the idea of conservation of momentum. If I had a wrench in my hand, I could throw a wrench the other way and I would be propelled towards the space shuttle. But I could also just wait. There is a force due to gravity on me 
pulling me towards the space shuttle. And that means I am exhibiting a force on the <coughs> space shuttle pulling it towards me. So if I just sit there and wait, eventually I will come together with the space shuttle. Now, that could be a very long time. You might run out of air. Why? Because G in SI units is a pretty small number, right? We got a 10 to the minus 11 there. So that force is going to be very small, but it is not zero. There is still a force trying to pull you back together. All right, so this was a major step in the history of physics because once Newton wrote this down, it essentially tied the universe together. Okay, and there was all sorts of, you know, religious, spiritual implications of this. But basically, from a physics point of view, before Newton, we didn't know that we were really literally tied to the rest of the universe. And then after Newton, we did know that. At the very least, we are tied together through gravity. Thank mm -hmm. you.